In the Nevada Museum of Art, a colorful crowd gawked at a slideshow that previewed this year's Burning Man art. Art manager Beth Scarborough says, as the event has grown, so has the art. 372 pieces this year, more than ever before. That's a huge leap in the amount of art that's coming out there. And we think it's because more and more people feel like they have the opportunity and the chance to actually do it. People have more opportunities because of large art building spaces like the 35,000 square foot warehouse in Sparks, Nevada called The Generator. Leading up to Burning Man, it was hopping. A DJ played music 12 hours a day in this mishmash of art, tools and materials. There's a metal and wood shop, 3D printer, computer controlled router, laser cutter, pianos, a fire truck, random paintings, scrawls on the walls, kitchen and a computer room. This is the generator's first year, and executive director Matt Schultz says it's a learning experience for everyone, from the artists to the unsolicited volunteers who show up every day to help. Um, and they open the door and they see this big intimidating workshop with five, six, seven, eight crews running around furiously trying to build stuff. It's not just free labor, tools and materials, the space is free. The whole thing is made possible by an anonymous $400,000 annual donation. The money is contingent on following the principles of inclusion, decommodification, and they must make art. There are seasoned artists, like a guy who calls himself Stringbean. He helped build the 60-foot tall bamboo control tower at the generator. It'll have uh, lasers on top and flamethrowers, and it'll be radar responsive, so you walk up to it, and the, the, the fireworks happen in response to crowd presence. Whole thing. So that's going to be your first color. It's going to move a little bit. And that's going to be your first color. It's also a place to learn to use tools, from welding to the laser cutter. And that's inspiring new artists, too. Like Ryan Andrews. He built a steel hot air balloon on top of an SUV. He says the free tools and space of the generator are awesome. So basically, this project would not exist without the generator. It would have been just a suburban with uh, a couch on the back, probably. <laughs> Executive Director Schultz says that's one of the goals of the generator, to inspire people who don't consider themselves artists to actually create something. But he says if only a few people use the space, well, that's okay too. It was, it was a tiny minority of the world's populace that sent a shuttle to the moon. A tiny minority of the world's populace that invented the computer. Like, some of the greatest things in the world were made by just a handful of people tinkering in a garage. We just have a big garage. Now that Burning Man is over, it's quieted down at the generator, but it is still available for anyone. Schultz says in the lull, all he can hope for is that this free space and tools will inspire people year-round to build amazing things that no one has ever seen. For KQED, I'm Kai Plaskon in Reno. Uh, Matthew Schultz, my title is Executive Director uh, at The Generator Inc. or The Generator. We have a single funder who funds all of this um, and we're, we're built as a 501c3. We're currently a Nevada nonprofit corporation and uh, so, I mean, for all legal purposes, the board distributes uh, the money from the funder. He's, he's invested a large amount of money over the years into a number of angel funds and um, causes that he's really passionate about. And I think it's just, I don't think he wants to be deluged by requests for more funding. Um, he's very much passionate about what we're doing and what this is. Um, it, creating an alternative for how we work, how we build, how we live, how we create. Um, and so that kind of, that's what really drives the funding and making the space real. It leaves me at a loss for words at times um, seeing how effectively this is this is growing and becoming part of a community, uh, I, I knew that I knew that people would be building in here and the space would fill up relatively quickly. We tried to control the growth to ensure that the space didn't just become overwhelming to the point where no one could make anything. Um, but the thing that was really incredibly surprising was um, the reaction of normal people, the reaction of people who don't normally build. Um, your standard member of society. Um, everyone comes through here with just a sense of joy, a sense of inspiration. Uh, it's, it's, it's as if 
it's as if we're doing something that no one expects to be real. Uh, it, to a lot of people, it's hard to put their mind around the fact that this place is here for people to use and be kind to each other with no strings attached. There's no contract. There's no profit sharing. We don't ask anything of anyone except for, you know, be kind to your neighbor, try to give back to the space in some way, and be productive. It, productivity is a, effectively everything in this space is a vague term. So productivity um, is very loosely defined in this space. Uh, I'm not expecting someone, if, if you're a painter, I'm not expecting to see 20 paintings every year. I'm expecting to see you paint once or twice a week. You know, come in and just work on the painting. If your painting takes 3,000 hours to finish, I don't care if it takes 10 years to do that. And that's incredibly important. The, the big thing is, is I just want a space where people can create at their own pace, in their own way, on their own time. Um, and we work it out with everybody. As a painter, you don't really need to be all that prolific because the space you take up is only going to be about 16 square feet. So you can sit there, have your resident space, and really enjoy it and create this world that's your own, a little world inside this big warehouse, and share it with everybody else. And then for the bigger projects, we, we give them a timeline and a time frame based on what they've told us. So, you know, if a bigger project's delayed a month, that's fine, two months, you know, but if, if the project doesn't get done within, you know, a fairly rigid timeline, then we have to work something else out. So I've always been someone who keeps a lot of this information in my head. So I just have a constant narrative with everybody. And that's what we're trying to encourage with everyone in this space is ultimately there isn't a lot documented written down there's not a lot of rules there's not a lot of there's not a large body of actual physical written documents dictating how this works the way it works is a bit of a of a kind of verbal tradition um we all talk to each other and i think it's really important for everyone to talk to each other to figure out how this works because you start making friends and acquaintances you start developing relationships with people in the space and we we then can talk about a greater question of community so when I talk to the projects, uh, I'm just feeling them out to see how their leads are feeling. And you can see, you can, you can watch a lead the way they're moving and just know What's whether they're behind. A, a project lead. So a director of a project. Because as I get to know their personality, then I can, I can look at them and I can see just by their body language, they might need a little hand today. And so if some people come in the space and they're like, I would really love to help with a big project. I'll send some people that way. Every day, we've probably had, um, we've probably had at least a half dozen people come in here today, and just want to volunteer on projects. It's such an amazing thing to have these volunteers coming in and wanting to help. But the big, the big challenge of it is, is that each of the leads have to manage their own crew and make sure their their own crew has jobs, has has things to do. And then when I introduce a new piece of the puzzle. It tests how organized each of these projects are. Effectively, the biggest challenge with a new volunteer is that you have to find a way to engage a new volunteer. To get the nerve up to just come in, to get the courage to say, I'm going to go in the generator, I'm going to help do something. Um, and they open the door and they see this big intimidating workshop with five, six, seven, eight crews running around furiously trying to build stuff. It's very hard to initiate, even just beyond getting in the door. And so if they get here and there's nothing for them to do, there's no direction for them to go, they're not going to come back. Just they, they blow me away. My expectations of who they were, or what they were, completely change when they're in the space. So there's great mixing of, of people and personalities and political ideas that's happening. And I've realized the more I let go of it, the more I let it organically happen the better it works. So we, we end up having we end up having a system where I just tell everyone to talk to everyone. Like part of the rules of the space when you first come in, I say, you know, just t say hello to everyone and make friends. And a lot of times when people find me, they'll ask for a tool. I'll say, you know what, one of those three crews has that tool. Just go ask them. And that conversation initiates a dialogue and they share that dialogue. And then they spread this this 
very interesting culture that we're developing to all the new people who come through the door, whether I'm here or not. Okay. The lineage of this space comes back to, um, I've always been an artist and I've always dreamed of eventually having a space like this. I used to daydream about winning the lottery and making a big giant warehouse where all my friends could come and build. And that was all, that was ridiculous. And that was an idea, that was a concept that on its own was fairly ridiculous, or at least I thought. Um, but it's happening now. It's exactly happening now. Um, so why are you saying it was ridiculous? It was ridiculous because at the time I wasn't doing anything to, to make it happen. Um, the second I stopped daydreaming about making art in the perfect space and started making art in whatever space I had and making the art I wanted, um, I had been laid off from my job for about a year, and I'd sold everything I owned and was traveling around Southeast Asia um, to make a film on happiness. I was just going to make a film. And I was in Malaysia, and I saw this rickety old pier floating, almost floating in, in, in off of Penang Island. And there were these big six-foot uh, six, big six foot Komodo dragon lizard-looking creatures swimming in the water, these ships banging against the side of this rickety... De decrepit pier. I thought for sure we were going to fall into the ocean. These giant lizards would consume us alive. And I hear this motor behind us, and it's an old man on a Vespa shooting down the pier. And there was a second there where I was like, this must be reproduced in the desert. So we built this pier. We built a 300 foot long Southeast Asian pier um, for not a lot of money. We recovered most of the wood, we found most of the props, we got friends, we built it in the backyard. And that allowed us to then get the backing to do our next project, which was a full-scale Spanish galleon crashed into the pier, which was much more expensive, much, but much more grand. So we just did it. Once again, we figured out ways to make a 90-foot long, a 36-foot tall, full-scale, three-story deep Spanish galleon with 10 rooms and over a thousand props and like seven journals and a four-year timeline and a 60-foot main mast and flame cannons. We still have it. We're trying to find a home for it. Um, which could be a whole nother conversation. So we were originally intending to try to sell the, the, the galleon uh, to fund an art space like this for a year. Um, and what had happened was no one was interested in buying the galleon at that point. The other issue is it's still 90 feet long and three stories tall. Like, no one's backyard fits that, <laughs> which is a major, major mistake when you're thinking about the scope and scale of this. But we built our dream. And so when we came back... Um, from the playa, I was wondering, well, what, what's the next step in our dream? We were just moving forward. And that's when I met Joe Olivier, one of our board members, um, after the event at Burning Man. Um, uh, he introduced me to our funder, who was, uh, he was really intrigued by what we had done. Uh, but he was more intrigued by the idea of starting a, a community build space. Um, taking the 10 principles of Burning Man uh, most importantly, being open, inclusive, and decommodified, and bringing them to the real world. I was I went back going, holy crap, we have a funder, we're going to get a bunch of money, uh, and I started thinking, well, we have to be sustainable. So I made this big business plan, and then we met with him maybe five months later, and I said, well, what do you think? He said, you guys are a horrible business, and I was crushed. I was absolutely crushed, and uh, then he looked at me, and he said, how would I just give you the money, and you make a space where everyone can come and build. And we make it open, inclusive, and decommodified and focus on building a community and building a place where everyone can come and create. Where, as long as this place inspires people to create and build, um, you know, basically work less, build more, play more. As long as this space continues to do that, as long as there's something really special here, we have funding. So the next step is to see what happens after Burning Man. The next step is to get projects from all around the country and the region in here to just build anything. Yeah, the next step is to get um, retired, retired women and kids and politicians and construction workers and people who may have never made art and get them in here and make art. All that people need is an encouraging voice and some resources and some friends to make whatever they want. And so we're just here as that encouraging voice and a collection of resources. The people here are what make this space amazing. The people who come in here and they're confused for a day and they come back and make something, that's what's amazing. 
and then hopefully we all create we unlock that sense of creativity in everyone and maybe then we can start inventing everyone's so enthusiastic here but are we tapping into a greater body of people that really want to build is this something that could become a movement where people are producing and building and creating in their day-to-day -day lives or is this a small collection of people who are just so excited that we've become so we've become a bit insular to a reality that maybe the rest of the people don't want to have to participate in all this stuff maybe there's just this very small group of builders who love creating everything and everyone else just wants it created for them so I wonder maybe that could be our ultimately our ultimate kind of tripping point is if in fact it's only a handful of a small percentage of people who want to build but then I, I, I look at that a bit deeper and I realize if it's only a handful of percentage of people who want to build let's encourage them to build amazing amazing things I mean it was it was a tiny minority of the world's populace that sent a shuttle to the moon a tiny minority of the world's populace that invented the computer like some of the greatest things in the world were made by just a handful of people tinkering in a garage. We just have a big garage. I would say at least half the tools in here are donated. So we have a fairly large body of resources that have been donated by the amazing community we have here. People are really inspired and they donate. But it's, it's so amazingly supplemented by some financial resources to then fill in those blanks. So we can have three or four key tools in our wood shop donated, and then we can buy the last two. So we have a complete wood shop. It's been four months. It's been, we are so young and we're growing and it's been incredible. And come, come October, we need to fill this place with projects. So we're looking for people who want to, who want to create and make friends and build a community. And they can do it in a big loud warehouse with lots of tools running and they'll smile and laugh um, while they make something amazing that no one's ever seen. If they can't walk in the door, just um, shoot me an email, just info at the Reno generator .com, um, and we can talk about it. We can figure out whether they want to build something really cool in Reno. Um, yeah, it's it's you know we if we get artists, we get people here. This is a this is a resource that's for everyone around the world and so they just have to find their way to our little town and make something really cool.